Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Vago Maradian. Our podcast is brought to you by Bell. Since 1935, Bell has been redefining flight. Learn more about its pioneering spirit at bellflight.com. Later in the program, Dr. Patrick Cronin of the Hudson Institute and filmmaker Andrew Duncan on China's recent assertive actions in Asia. But first, but first, Joining us is Byron Callen of the independent Washington research firm, Capital Alpha Partners. Byron, thanks very much for joining us. Great to be here on a Monday. Before we get started, our global coverage is sponsored by Leonardo DRS. Northrop Grumman sponsors our weekly cyber report and our cyber coverage overall. Fincantieri, Marinette Marine sponsors our naval coverage, and of course, Bell sponsors this podcast. Byron, absolutely a fascinating series of comments uh, from the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, Ellen Lord, today to reporters uh, at the Pentagon, uh, talking about how actually that there could be a three-month schedule impact and billions and billions of dollars in cost impact because of the coronavirus pandemic. We've been talking to a lot of uh, CEOs. We had uh, Navy Acquisition Chief Hondo Gertz. Uh, on last week, who was unwilling to say whether or not the the magnitude of the impact on schedule delays. Ellen Lord mentioned that uh, aviation programs and and shipyards in particular uh, would be impacted. Talk to us a little bit about her message, because you've been analyzing that all day. Uh, This, uh, which comes uh, just before prime earnings, the first quarter earnings disclosures uh, that investors have been keenly looking forward to, to gauge the impact of this pandemic on industry. Well, yeah, I think there were three main parts to the press conference that happened the morning of of uh, March of, of April twentieth. Um, she did mention, you know, this three month impact, and I think she really singled out MDAP, the the major defense acquisition programs. And you're right, she specifically called out shipbuilding, aviation, and I'm using her terms, and uh, small satellite launch uh, providers. So. Stitching those three together, you know, there are a couple of questions, which is, okay, you know, there have been press reports about um, up in Bath Ironworks, and there's been, you know, you can look at the Huntington Ingalls and Newport News websites, you know, very liberal leave policies to deal with with COVID-19. I don't know if it's actual impacts or fears of COVID-19. So I'm not too surprised about that comment, although it, it did seem to run a counter to some of some of uh, other DOD leadership comments, uh, mo- most recently some of the things that Hondo Gertz had talked about on, on one of your broadcasts. Um, so we'll see. Aviation, most certainly, you know, Boeing had shut down production uh, briefly on the, well, it impacted the KC-46 and the P-8, and then they think they briefly shut down helicopter uh, production in, in uh, Philadelphia. So I don't know, and, and Rocket Lab, I believe, had uh, postponed a launch of some NRO satellites. That was something that happened back in March. So the kind of things that struck me, at least on that comment on the, the three-month delay and the impacts, you know, why, why weren't other program areas mentioned? Um, why would something like this just be listed, limited to those uh, three segments when, you know, electronics, radar, ra- radios, Um, vehicle programs, precision guided weapons, you know, all the other things that go into uh, into building out national security, what would make those sectors different from the three that she mentioned? Um, And then I think the other part, it was pretty clear, you know, the three months was really just a a time frame. It wasn't like this was a rigorous plan to get everything back on course. um, Because I don't think uh, Secretary Lord, or for that matter, anybody else looking at this knows exactly when we're going to kind of get back to a more normal uh, path of activity uh, for defense and for the economy and society at large. Why do you think her disclosure came when it did? I don't really know. I don't know the background for why this press conference was held when it was. It it did happen on the eve of uh, earnings season. As you mentioned, you know, Lockheed Martin will be the first to, to report earnings. Um, I think a lot of, of companies are just going to struggle with this range of uncertainty. Um, you know, people are going to be looking for managements for what they're going to guide to this current fiscal year uh, or calendar year. And, you know, I don't think anybody has a real clear crystal ball about when everything's going to come back. So 
you could argue, I suppose, that, that this particular conference may have given contractors a little bit of, of headroom to say, hey, um, it's uncertain, you know, DOD has talked about a three month time frame. you know, that's an assessment, that's not something cast in concrete. Uh, we all have to kind of take this, uh, uh, you know, a, a week or month at a time. Um, you know, that, that could be one, one explanation for it. Um, as you look at this uh, situation, how do you, I mean, do we stop at a couple of billion dollars? And how does this tie to the CARES Act? Because CARES Act, CARES Act has $17 billion uh, that are in it for the defense industry. There's been a lot of conversation about how much of that is Boeing. Talk to us about what the aggregate impact of all of this is likely to be, well, given that, that the yeah. sorts of things starts with, you know what I mean? It starts with, yeah, it'll be a couple of billion dollars, and then before you know it, it's, it's a lot more than a couple of billion dollars. Well, well, yeah, you have to separate two. There were two other components to the press conference that were interesting, and one was she talked a little bit about that $17 billion that was in the CARES Act. Now, that was really for companies that could show that they were harmed by COVID-19. And I think when that provision came out of the bill, uh, everybody thought, oh, this is, this is all about Boeing. But I think more broadly, it's going to be about commercial aerospace. It could be about uh, commercial space launch. Uh, you know, some of these other adjacencies that the DOD is going to rely upon that have seen the stuffing knocked out of demand uh, for commercial businesses, and they're going to need some help. Um, so I think you know, she made a comment, they're working well with Treasury. DOD had kind of sent over a list of what some of the priority areas and sectors should be um, when they think about that $17 billion, uh, you know, fund, I guess, if, if this is a way to think of $17 billion appropriation. Now, the other thing she mentioned was <clears throat> they were going to be looking for, they, the DOD, was going to be looking for billions and billions of dollars in whatever new fiscal package uh, comes out. If it's the phase four or phase five, you know, she wasn't clear. She really didn't bound how much was going to be asked for, but there had been a clear impact on uh, the DOD plans to kind of accelerate progress payments, uh, particularly through their primes, so that, that could get back down into the supply chain, into the lower tiers of industry. Um, there's a, there's a, you know, a cash impact that on DOD. It shouldn't change the over co overall cost of a program. This is really just a phasing of how cash is paid out on particular contracts. But that was kind of interesting too, because um, I, I could understand, you know, making those changes and how that would have an impact on FY20. <clears throat> but then it would really raise the question of, are you just pulling money forward from FY21 uh, into FY20 to, to, you know, push these higher progress payment rates up. So it, it's another interesting question uh, that I think we'll just have to watch for the coming weeks to see how it really plays through. Um, what are uh, two uh, quick questions? What are your anticipations of what we're going to see earnings wise uh, coming out of companies in terms of what COVID impact is like? And if you can also try to tie this, uh, you know, and, and my follow-up question is on uh, oil uh, being in negative territory for the first time, I think, in anybody's memory, which is a fairly astonishing yeah. development. Um, look, I think generally, <clears throat> you know, the con if you looked at outlays for uh, the first quarter that ended March 31st, the calendar quarter, you know, they were up 6% for O&M and about 6% for, for, uh, for procurement and RDT&E. Um, those are the two most important appropriations categories or three most appropriation three most important appropriations categories for the defense sector so you know i think but going forward you know i'm almost ambivalent um if companies come out and reiterate their guidance i don't really know what firm foundation they have to make that guidance because they don't really know you know what are all the nuances and the impacts on their uh, <clears throat> their financials over the balance of this year, I think you know SEIC, which is a little off step from other companies because they're on a different uh, fiscal year. You know they they reiterated guidance, but said, hey, we uh, <clears throat> we we're offering this guidance without factoring in the impact of COVID nineteen. 
So you could see some of that. What contractors have done that in the past when you've had uncertainty around sequestration. Hey, here's our guidance for the full year. There's this uncertainty in Congress. You know, we'll kind of address that. You know, we, we think we're going to get a CR by X date. Um, you know, the implication is if that doesn't happen, then something new is going to differ, uh, emerge. So, you know, in, in, in the, on oil prices, Vago, I think, you know, this is really kind of the weirdness of um, oil pricing. Uh, these are futures that are really driving this and the fact that there's no place to store oil right now. So um, <clears throat> if you have a couple of extra 55 gallon barrels that you could get oil and store it in your basement, um, I wouldn't recommend that. But you know, I think this is really kind of a, a, a storage problem. The bigger economic impact for the United States is that if this persists, that you, you get a couple of months of you know, negative or, or exceptionally low oil prices, that this demand doesn't start to pick up, that's when you start shutting down uh, shale production. And you know, that can take time to restart too. And that's going to have an impact on, uh, frankly, it could have an impact on the 2020 election. Byron, thanks very much for joining us as always. Appreciate it. Look forward to having you back on on Thursday for the full roundtable conversation on this. You got it. Anytime. And now a word from our sponsor. The Defense and Aerospace Report is brought to you by the Bell V280 Valor, bringing the mission technology of the future to the battlefield of today. Visit bellflight.com for more. As Washington has been distracted by the coronavirus crisis, that's already claimed the lives of more than 40,000 Americans in a month, China has been accelerating its efforts to assert its authority in Asia. Over the past month, China has ordered the roundup of leading Hong Kong democracy advocates engaged in a confrontation with a Malaysian drill ship, sank a Vietnamese fishing boat, garnered territorial concessions from Indonesia, and increased its saber rattling toward Taiwan, staging increasingly aggressive patrols into Taiwanese airspace and sea space to deliberately provoke an incident with Taipei that Beijing can use as a causes belli, or at least that's a fear that leading analysts have. Despite the virus sidelining the carrier Theodore Roosevelt, the administration has continued freedom of navigation exercises to assert its right to transit international waters, but also withdrew B-52 bombers from Guam, aircraft that have been forward deployed to Anderson Air Force Base for 16 years. Joining us to discuss China's actions and how Washington and its allies should respond are Dr. Patrick Cronin of the Hudson Institute, and Andrew Duncan, an award-winning filmmaker who is also a Hong Kong and China democracy advocate. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Patrick, start us off. Clearly, China is trying to take advantage of the distracted, uh, distracted international community. We talked some weeks ago about how China is not only trying to take advantage of the situation externally, but that there are powerful internal reasons for Beijing to drum up nationalism to shore up the Chinese Communist Party that has a very delicate compact with the Chinese uh, people. You give up freedom, you get security and prosperity. Now all of that is under threat, not just because of the virus, but the economic damage it's been causing. Walk, walk us through Beijing's strategy and how the United States and its allies have to respond. Well, Bago, thank you. That is an important question. I don't want to pretend that it's a simple one, and it's not a simple compact either. It's one that I think has evolved over the decades here, especially while the People's Republic of China has moved from providing that kind of economic performance that provided legitimacy after Mao to now a greater mix of nationalism, even xenophobia, mixed with the technocratic competence, kind of trying to build trust in the leadership and in, in sort of uh, around Xi Jinping in particular. And yet in the last year and a half, you've had a number of setbacks for uh, Beijing. Um, Xi Jinping's relationship with the United States wasn't uh, working out well, um, and Chinese wondered whether that was Xi's fault in part. Then the economic slowdown seemed to get uh, uh, steam, and that was a problem. And then the pandemic on top of it, and including the early uh, performance in the pandemic, all of which has led to a very concerted uh, shift to pivot Beijing and by Xi Jinping to show that they are indeed on top of the crisis, that they think that they've got a, a model uh, for how to handle a pandemic, uh, they're trying to export uh, goods now, uh, and yet the other economies of the world are not open for business. So they have real problems with the economic side. Um, nationalism is, is taking its place, and so nationalism is being felt 
over the Taiwan issue, over the Hong Kong issue, over the South China Sea issue, and beyond. And I think um, that is a danger because uh, those are very explosive forces that uh, Beijing is playing with. There are limits to what they want to do with this nationalism at the moment, but nonetheless, it's clear whether you look at the Hong Kong overreach by Beijing this past week or uh, in the South China Sea an announcing a new uh, set of administrative centers for controlling the South China Sea, for instance, and then naming features um, to kind of poke back at Vietnam in particular, that for me is a very clear common thread of uh, wanting to make sure that China's rules are going to be dominant and therefore Xi Jinping's power will be reinforced at home. And so that's the relationship here between the foreign policy and the domestic policy. Xi Jinping needs to find new means of trussing up support for him as he thinks about two years down the road, uh, the next party Congress that could essentially um, say, look, two term limits for even Xi Jinping is enough. We don't need to uh, try out this new rule of, of no term limits for the uh, general secretary of the party. Um, I, I want to go to Andrew, but I have to ask you a follow-up. I mean, one one of the cases that she made to get a lifetime term was to tell uh, the Council of Elders, I can, I am the only man suited to stick it to the Americans, uh, as well as to take back Taiwan. Um, and and that concern that his internal position is weak is what had some people concerned, for example, that she would act out against Hong Kong, as well as act out and try to realize, to try to take advantage of this distraction to sort of move on Taiwan. He has now taken a step in Hong Kong uh, by rounding up democracy advocates. Do you think that the danger of conflict is actually going up or the, the danger of Chinese miscalculation, in part driven by the Chinese view that the American president cares more, is, is focused really on trade and a trade deal, right? And, there is ample evidence that that's the case, and, and a number of mutual friends across the region have said that. Do you think that the prospect for a potential miscalculation goes up or down? Well, again, a good question, Vago. Um, I'd say, in, in general, the risk goes up, but I want to put a caveat on that to say you, there are too many variables here to kind of say there's one set linear path that this is going to lead to conflict. Um, in reality, both China, the United States in particular, are beset by this pandemic and economic fallout is only really beginning to be felt. Um, and I don't think either one is spoiling for a conflict at, at the large level. At the same time, um, plenty of room for miscalculation and plenty of room for the nationalist forces that I described driving Xi's policy right now to want to uh, hit back at America when uh, the United States under the Trump administration has been extraordinarily critical. Um, uh, much of it well-deserved, not all of it, but much of it well-deserved on China. Um, and um, China, meanwhile, is, is pushing back and it's able to take vengeance out on Taiwan, on Hong Kong, on the South China Sea countries and other claimants much more than it can on the United States. So here we have a situation growing in the South China Sea where you've got the amphibious uh, ship, the USS America, uh, heading toward where the Chinese are pressing some of their uh, excessive claims, even beyond the nine dash line claim of most of the South China Sea. And that's the kind of situation that could see a dust up. Um, you, you, you never discount that. But I, I don't think this is going to lead to war, but it could lead to a further hardening of uh, a, a bad China-U.S. relationship that will play into the into the 2020 presidential election, play into regional politics about who's up, who's down, um, do we bandwagon with China, do we balance with the United States, and so on. Andrew, let me bring you into the conversation. You're a keen watcher uh, of Beijing and are very, very close to the entire, I mean, almost everybody rounded up, you consider to be friends. Talk to us about the implications of the arrests in Hong Kong and what's next? Because um, we, we've had analysts basically say, hey, look, we're all so distracted here with a coronavirus that, you know, this doesn't play as big on the radar screen as it should. You know, I'll start with the old Tip O'Neill, Thomas O'Neill, the former uh, Speaker of the House. And all politics is local. And so I'm going to start in the local level just in Hong Kong, but then I'll try to extrapolate out why it's important and why it matters to, to Americans. So Martin Lee was arrested, 81-year-old uh, uh, leader, father of democracy in Hong Kong, 
and someone that I know and respect and, and truly love as a fellow human being in the, in the global scene. He's been a he's a surrogate grandfather to many people. 81 years old, has never been arrested, goes to Catholic Church Mass every single day. Uh, is probably one of the more devout Christians that I've ever met in my life, both uh, behaviorally and how he practices his life. And for him to be arrested at 81 years old with a COVID-19 uh, hanging over jails and institutions all over the world, for him to be put into any kind of jail cell is an absolute disgrace. Um, it's a violation of the Hong Kong Democracy Act. And I think you saw, uh, I think you saw reaction from Jim McGovern and from uh, Marco Rubio and from uh, Bill Barr. And I think you also saw from, from Speaker Pelosi in her tweet yesterday. Um, this is a different ball game now. They're going to, Chinese are going to classically try to, uh, Beijing, specifically the Chinese Communist Party, are going to try to probe and see which different areas they can push right now in light of this situation. They're making a huge, huge, huge miscalculation. What they don't understand is this time is that they've messed with the entire American public with this pandemic. They certainly have culpability with this. Um, uh, it's clear it was the situation was clearly mishandled. Um, uh, even Xi Jinping's comments back in January, you knew he was in big trouble when he used the word grave. For uh, he, he they, they knew they had a big problem, and um, there is a reparation that's going to have to take place here. There's going to be parties in this country that are going to want a trimming of the treasury. Uh, auction the treasury note payback in terms of the debt, the national debt to China. That they're going to, there's going to be some very interesting conversations that are going to have to happen. And I just don't know if Beijing understands how much trouble they're in. The Chinese Communist Party is at a crossroads. They need to make a decision here. Are they going to keep riding with Xi Jinping or and play all or nothing? Or are they going to try to cut their losses with Xi Jinping and try to clip his wings a little bit? This is a big moment in time for them with very, very, uh, consequential decisions to make because China has lost the support, not only of the United States, but much of the rest of the world. And you're seeing it in the United Kingdom right now as they reverse their highway decision. Andrew, um, I'd like to get your uh, take on this, um, given, and, and uh, Patrick, uh, your take on this uh, as well. Do you believe that China's efforts to deploy medical personnel, send ventilators, masks, personal protective equipment to nations uh, around the world has sort of helped improve China's case? I mean, we've had Italian politicians sort of say, the era of American leadership is over and the era of Chinese leadership has dawned. You can go to the uh, Arab Gulf states, uh, you know, a lot of warm feelings to the help that they've gotten from uh, the Chinese. Do you think that that changes the global dynamic in favor of Beijing? I, I do not at all because they're, it's band-aid on the problem that they created. Um, no matter how you cut it, the Wuhan situation was poorly handled, and the truth hasn't come out. And Vago, I would agree with uh, with Andrew there. I mean, you've got to look at the whole board of what China's doing, and nobody's just looking at the aid they're offering up at this moment. Um, so if you just go back to the Hong Kong example of rounding up an 81-year-old um, uh, you know, thinker, uh, very popular man uh, behind the democracy movement, and then you say that this is somehow related to terrorism threats, I mean, nobody in the world believes that. Um, the absolutism that's coming out of the, the Chinese state media uh, in defense of some of its actions show just how inherently dishonest they're being. So I don't think anybody is suddenly going to trust Beijing's policies. But, you know, in a storm, any port will do. And everybody's fighting this pandemic and worried about the economy. If China's offering some assistance, sure, let's look at that. But, but don't pass a judgment as to whether this changes our view of the nature of the regime and, and what it's been doing. So um, where we do um, have to reckon our own shortcomings, though, with this is that this is not just about China. This is about us and our behavior and our transparency, our effectiveness, um, our diplomacy. And I think there, there's plenty of room, uh, you know, even strongest supporters of the administration would say there's still plenty of room. Um, for the United States to be doing a much better job both at home and abroad in terms of managing the public health and economic crisis that we've, we're dealing with. So I think the president has to, when you're looking at the president's situation with the, with the administration right now, he, they did a very good job on China for a very long time. And he deserves a lot, President Trump deserves a lot of credit for elevating this issue and taking it on. And I honestly don't think that a, a Democrat or Republican a conventional Democrat or a conventional Republican would have been positioned to take on this 
the China issue. So he deserves credit for that. But like in in hindsight's 2020, I'd like to uh, you know set the stage with the uh, everyone can be a, a Monday morning quarterback. But I think the president got into a couple of hot water situations with China. And I think the first was in October when he came to the driveway and admitted to a CNN report that he had asked for dirt on Joe Biden in the October, early October. And then what happened was clearly the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party knew what was going on in, in December, and they rushed to the table to do the trade deal. And I think that trade deal became, for political reasons also here in the United States, because of the red states involved with agriculture, became un, perhaps unwittingly, so I don't want to categorize it, but I just want to state facts. I think that became a distraction. And the timing of that, I do not think it was the impeachment. I think it's the trade deal that, that if you look back and do a TikTok on this over time, is I think that's what caused a big part of the problem is that they, they became blinded to those issues. And let's go back and, and go back to the common issue of November. You still have 3 million Uyghurs, 3 million Muslims in concentration camps in China. That still has not changed. And I would get back to what I said during my MBA protest of last October. The NBA shouldn't be in business with people running concentration camps, nor should the United States government be in business with people running concentration camps. And I think, uh, it, it, like I said, hindsight's 2020. The WTO was a very good idea at the time to let them into the WTO. And the idea that capitalism would crush communism over time was a, was a, was a realistic expectation, but it didn't work. And I think this is an example right here, the pandemic situation. We're doing a trade deal with people that do not have due process of law or have control of their society. I just don't think that that's a, that's a good model for the United States to, to get entrapped in. And we have to look at now a model of, of are we going to continue the status quo with uh, Beijing or is containment now a serious option on the table? Do um, The question, though, is, right, even though the attorney general has – uh, criticized uh, China's uh, move in Hong Kong, and the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, has, has done the same thing. Well, governments, at the end of the day, want to hear the leader of the United States make those statements. The president has uh, used very kind words towards Xi throughout this uh, crisis, has said, you know, the Chinese have got a handle on it, they've got it contained, it's not going to come here. Uh, and it, uh, you know, the, not only has the virus come here, but there appears to be a gap between what the president's team and some of his advisors are saying. Nobody was stronger on this than H.R. McMaster, who talked very, very eloquently about the great power competition and was seminal in uh, shaping the national security strategy and a national defense strategy that were said all the right things and arguably are, are uh, some of the best strategic documents we've created in a long time. And yet there's this concern that the president is not on that reservation and worse, not only is the president not on that reservation, but the Chinese know it, which becomes more problematic. Patrick, does it matter what the president of the United States ultimately says? It does. And I think the Trump brand in Asia is actually dragging us down compared to where we could be. And I say that as somebody who supports a lot of things that the Trump administration is doing in Asia, including, as Andrew talks about, the getting credit on much of the China policy waking up to a decade that we were too uh, lackadaisical in sort of picking up what China was doing. But I hear the difference, I think, is that the administration overall understands the balance of power. But for President Trump, the balance of power doesn't seem to apply to ideas. And I think Democrats and Republicans uh, who have been working on Asia policy for decades would say it has to apply to ideas as well. This is you know, think about the think about Hong Kong. It's opened up important, vital democratic space in Asia. That's important for our, our even our realist uh, power uh, in in the world. And we have to recognize that when China then moves to crack down on Hong Kong's democratic uh, autonomy, um, that is that is hurting our core interests, not just our values. And I think that's the importance. And, and Trump focuses on the hard power. He doesn't focus as much on, on the ideas about democracy and human rights. All presidents of both parties have always balanced that along with interests. But, uh, you know, Michael Green in his book talks about, the, you know, since the American Revolution, the real contest here is between uh, America's desire for self-determination, self-government. Our whole republic is based on essentially 
states' rights and self-determination versus universal rights, the Thomas Paine, that this is should apply to everybody. Everybody should be allowed a basic democratic right, some freedom. And you know, after 5,000 years of this great civilization of China, you would think the CCP would have a little more respect for human liberty and individual liberty, and they don't, they don't get that. Uh, and, that's, and that's something that the president could be playing upon more. And I think that's where other members of his administration would encourage him to, to, to do that. He, he supports them. I mean, when, when, he, when he finally is uh, told this is the best thing we should be doing, he may give it some time, but he doesn't focus on it as much as other officials. And maybe that's, you know, maybe that's normal. But I think most presidents would take more advantage of the fact that China is ignoring basic human rights and democracy. And that uh, is something that all Americans would understand. And I, I would agree with that. I, I'd like to add to that also is that there, there's a situation where the, um, uh, I, I think that the, they, they are not, they, the Chinese Communist Party is not understanding how important that issue is. And nor, n neither are some Americans, although they're catching on. Human rights is like a dumpster fire. And I would say that the Obama administration, the two biggest mistakes they made in foreign policy were Syria and in China. And human rights are the dumpster fire that becomes the six alarm fire when you see it. And it all gets down to due process of law. And China cannot operate without having due process of law. If, if Martin Lee is going to get arrested without due process of law, one of the finest human beings you'll ever meet, if he's going to and goes to Catholic mass every single day and has never been arrested in his 81 years, if he's going to get arrested, then how do U.S. corporations on a trade deal ever think they're going to get due process of law? The answer to that question is they're not. Let me uh, take you guys to the question of how all of this is going to play out uh, in the presidential campaign. Uh, the president has tried to position himself as tough on China, was an issue that I think that he wanted to run on. Um, Joe Biden has put out a very, very strong ad um, using some of the president's own words about China against them. On the other hand, you could argue that Joe Biden is, is vulnerable on China, in part because he was part of the last administration that pursued a strategy uh, that, that China had a lot of gains uh, while uh, Joe Biden was vice president, albeit um, given that there was a strategy to try to engage China whether and work with China successfully, whether it was on climate, on trade, uh, as well as uh, on Iran and other uh, sort of global issues. Um, how do you think this is going to play out ultimately, Patrick? And, and then would like to get your view as well, Andrew. Well, at this point um, here in April, Vago, it's hard for me not to paraphrase James Carville. You know, it's the economy stupid. It's the coronavirus stupid. It's COVID-19. And I think that's really going to be the referendum in November. And China will be a subset of that in most probability. Um, it's because it's related to the economic handling. It's related to the handling of the public health crisis, the confidence in government, uh, the leadership out of Washington. And China's, again, a part of all of that, but it's, it's not necessarily in the lead. It could become the leading issue. I mean, especially if a crisis erupts directly with China. Um, but I, I think that, um, you know, the, the, both Biden and Trump are going to have to campaign on uh, the idea that they could have a better uh, recovery um, plan out of this uh, situation we're in with the pandemic, which right now has no end in sight. Um, and the economic deep hole is getting bigger and bigger. Um, China looms large because we can't really afford to have enemies anywhere in the world right now, not that it's just up to us, um, when we're trying to deal with this domestic crisis. But as this crisis subsides, we're going to be uh, having to compete from a different position with a very big power run by the Chinese Communist Party uh, with, with their clear plan in mind and with Xi Jinping using nationalism to try to uh, save his own job. So I think um, we're going to need the kind of uh, Trump's toughness on China, along with Biden's sort of understanding that we need a comprehensive plan um, that, that helps all Americans economically uh, in dealing with uh, the complex world we're in. So I, I think both both candidates are going to have uh, an interesting job selling this. We already see some of this coming out in the press, and it's it's very partisan. I don't want to go to the partisan side of it. I, and I know the people who are writing the talking points on both sides. 
Um, and, and both sides are obviously putting the best case forward from their perspective and the worst case on their opponent. The reality is that there is no American administration, period, that knows how to effectively deal uh, with the competition that we are in with China and at the same time maintain enough of a balanced relationship with China to convince the world that we know what we're doing and that we're capable of leadership. And as we move toward ratcheting up the pressure to compete with China, which I think we need to do and is the right thing to do in general, um, we still have to figure out how we sell our leadership in the Indo-Pacific and in Europe and around the world. And that comes down to 5G and it comes down to a lot of the trade, the trade rules, it comes down to a lot of specific issues that we're going to have to manage in 2021 and beyond. Andrew? I think it's a complicated issue on a on a few levels, so I'll start with what, what I think some of the issues are. I think, first off, um, the platforms of the Democratic and Republican National Committee are going to be very, very important uh, in terms of what they say uh, on China and how they stand up to it. Also, it's going to be interesting to see what, what is going to be the position of both parties in regards to reparations. What is the Chinese Communist Party going to do to pay for what a very much appears to be a, a, a colossal mishandling of a of a pandemic. That, that is a very real issue. Then it gets into more complicated things for, for President Trump because it goes to a trade deal that, in many of our opinions, was unachievable in the first place. So clearly they're not going to be able, in, in fairness to the Chinese Communist Party, not going to be able to achieve those goals in this current environment. So how is that going to get reconciled by the president um, in this environment where things are going to be highly charged, where 70 percent of the American public are holding the Chinese Communist Party accountable? Uh, to what's occurred. So I think it's very, uh, very tricky. And, and um, President, former Vice President Biden's track record in China is uh, uh, is checkered at best. And uh, so I, I think it's a very, it's going to be a very interesting situation to see how, how they go through. I personally, I think the uh, former Vice President Biden's best tactical model right now from a campaign situation is to work hard to get to the right of Donald Trump. And, uh, and and try to really uh, all the things that have been said that about Xi Jinping's my friend, um, which is not consistent with um, Secretary Pompeo and others in the administration, but is consistent with Secretary Mnuchin and other folks in the administration. I think that's going to be a, a very interesting thing to see how it plays out. There's traditionally in quadrennial elections in the U.S. been a lot of anti-China rhetoric um, that's been followed up with the behavior. Um, this may be a situation that's different. There's the stakes in the Sino-American relationships going into a U.S. general election have never been higher, in my opinion. Um, let me ask, uh, before we part, one uh, question, which I should have um, actually asked uh, earlier in the program and very briefly would like to get uh, from, from both of you. Patrick, you know, this economic slowdown, I mean, one of the key engines for China has been rapid economic growth, relentless economic growth. I mean, the administration in China deserves a lot of credit for raising more you know, helping raise more people out of poverty than any other administration in history. And despite that massive uh, economic benefit to the Chinese people, only half the people have been uh, lifted to an economic level that uh, stabilizes the country to sort of middle class living standard. Um, is there a concern that there is a concern that in the wake of this, not only will Western buying be down, but also leading nations and companies may decide to move supply chains out of China uh, in order to, you know, whether for domestic medical equipment or anything else. At the end of the day, does that make China potentially more dangerous if there is a much sharper, more prolonged economic shift? Or is the notion that its own market is large enough and it doesn't need these external sources something that the Chinese government can rely on? Well, Vago, I think the economic crisis and the pandemic uh, together teach all countries, all economies that have been trading with China, that they should not be too dependent, too reliant on China. Now, some economies matter more than others. And so when you have the world's third largest economy, Japan, under Prime Minister Abe, who had been preparing to hold a summit with Xi Jinping and then host him at the Olympics this summer, um, moving so uh, clearly to limit the damage to Japanese manufacturing in the future and their vulnerability by moving manufacturing further out of the mainland, um, back to Japan, to Southeast Asia and elsewhere, 
that's a sign that has to be worrisome to Beijing. And yes, that could in turn produce the kind of pressures in China that we saw, frankly, in Japan back in the 1930s. I, I don't want to compare pair those two exactly, so I apologize already for, for making that direct comparison. Um, but the point is, there is a, uh, there's a reason why protectionism was abandoned after the Depression, um, you know, because it was seen as potentially driving us down into conflict. Um, it depends on how far one goes in that direction. So if these are course corrections, if these are now uh, long overdue reforms after China. You say China picked all those people out of poverty. They did, but they did it on the backs of our global trading system that was designed for free market uh, economies. And uh, we do need course corrections. We do need, especially in the information revolution era, uh, the fourth, fourth industrial revolution, so-called um, new protections on these kind of uh, areas. So there are things that have to be adapted, but you can't and we should not throw away the entire edifice of the architecture that we helped to build after Bretton Woods in World War II. That was a great achievement. We need to we need to reform it. We need to change it. China needs to be part of it to the extent that it's willing to be reciprocal and play by the rules. And we need to enforce those rules. But that that means we have to be mindful that as we punish China when they deserve some punishment, we also have to be looking for a political result of bringing them back into a system that ultimately the world needs. We need a, a world trading system that works relatively well. And, um, you know, that's that's a tall order. This doesn't happen overnight. Um, I don't think China's being driven to war anytime soon because of uh, some of the manufacturing pullout and people uh, decoupling from China to protect their own supply chains, to protect their own critical industries. Uh, but uh, we need to find middle ground here at some point uh, as well. Andrew? It's going to be very interesting with the, with China in regards to the green mailing that they've done. Their, their tactics of uh, green mailing and trying to move institutionally into the United States, I think, are going to receive serious pushback. And I, I also wouldn't give the Chinese Communist Party credit for the big bringing people out of poverty. I think the United States taxpayers, the, the good people of our fellow Americans here in the United States, had a lot to do with it by letting them into the WTO in 1997, that was a magic moment for them. For the two companies like Apple to have their supply chains here to build iPhones has given them a machine and, and assisted them. And I think it's uh, it, it hasn't been all good. I think people have put their heads in the sand in regards to the China issue for a long time. And now we have a pandemic and we see how uh, no due process of law and irresponsible dictatorships, when they get out of control, they, they, they have an impact. Obviously, Joshua Wong and these other stories out of Hong Kong or Taiwan, why does that matter to somebody in Des Moines, Iowa? That's always been an issue. Like, how do you get it to, why does that affect Middle America? And is shipping agricultural product out of Des Moines, is that more important? Well, I'll tell you, a pandemic in Des Moines, Iowa, that's a big problem. So I think this has become personalized to the United States, to the, our fellow Americans, and to the United States uh, citizenry. And I think there's going to be a hard look at it, and you're going to see a lot of supply chains come back to the United States. And I think what you're also going to see, additionally, what Andrew Yang was talking about in his presidential campaign, you're going to see a lot of robotization of that. And um, that it's not going to be a net new adder of, of, of jobs uh, into our economy at a time when we could really need it, potentially. Um, that The idea of employing people versus robotics are going to become a big part of this um, uh, uh, you know, major inflection point that I think is going to come with the exiting of manufacturing in China, which I do think is going to occur. How can you have your ventilators and your masks and your other critical functioning equipment? I think people are shocked at the supply chains and how deep they are into China. And I do not think the, uh, the United States is going to allow that to continue. Uh, but uh, 30 seconds and quickly from both of you, if its economic future looks bleaker at a time when the Chinese Communist Party is already under a lot of internal pressure, does that make China more dangerous or not? Well, the International, yeah. Monetary Fund, you know, the International Monetary Fund, though, is saying it's going to grow by 9% next year, which I can't believe. But, um, you know, yes, I agree with Andrew. If, <laughs> if it's absolutely going to be into negative territory economically uh, for months to come and, and well into next year, then, yes, they're much more dangerous. They have an absolute leadership under Xi Jinping, and he wants to preserve his position. Um, yeah, that, that is the kind of nationalism that we should all be on guard for. 
I think that's a great, excellent um, analysis right there. I would just add to it though that Xi uh, Jinping's going to be under under the spotlight a lot more than he ever has been before. And there's going to be an Icarus factor. He's floating close to the sun right now, and he could really get burned up. And the question will be, when does the Chinese Communist Party cut their losses with him? Um, I think that's got to be that that has to be an issue that they're at least quietly and in private have to be assessing right now because the um, the, the the cost of the Chinese uh, machine is, is is very dear right now. There there's going to be a big penalty, and any thoughtful person in the world knows that. You can see. Just by the Huawei activity in, in, in the United Kingdom, you can see a big U-turn going on all over the world in Germany and other places around the world. And I think things are going to get uh, are going to get very difficult for them. And the Chinese Communist Party is coming up very soon to a crossroads and they're going to have to make a decision. Do we want uh, is Xi Jinping, not the United States, an existential threat to the party? And what do we do about it? Gentlemen, thanks so much for spending so much time with us. Absolutely fascinating conversation. Andrew, uh, I think you're right. And I think in the wake of this pandemic, uh, not only is the, I think robotization overall is something that is likely uh, to uh, increase for a whole variety of reasons, in part because it reduces your reliance, uh, not just on, on uh, you know, you reduce your reliance on human beings who could get sick and then uh, interfere with uh, supply chains uh, as well. Gentlemen, thanks very much. You're welcome back on uh, anytime. Best of luck. Thank you. I hope you and yours uh, stay well. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Stay well. And thanks for joining us this week. Please follow our daily interviews with top government, military, industry, and thought leaders at Defense and Aerospace Report and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Follow us on Twitter at Def Aero Report. That's at the F-A-E-R-O Report. Like us on Facebook at Defense and Aerospace Report and check us out on LinkedIn. Look for our weekly cyber report sponsored by Northrop Grumman. For more than 80 years, Bell has pushed past the boundaries of what's possible to drive aviation forward, going above and beyond flight, bellflight.com. Thanks again to Bell for their generous sponsorship, and we'll see you again tomorrow.